It's so lovely Hi, Rocket to have Man. You How are you doing? Do you know what? Elton John fans in there. Saw what I was doing to Debs. Yes, Absolute Elton John right. sneer by She's me there. She's referring to my excellent glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I am a feminist, but... When you asked me a day and a half ago to co-host this evening, I was like, Deborah, for you, anything. I'm a feminist in my core. I would support you to the death. What time? 9 p.m.? Same time as Love Island. Oh. <laughs> it's And it was true. a real dilemma. It's yeah, true. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a real dilemma. Yeah. I turned up, but aggressively so. <laughs> the nice thing about television now is you don't have to watch it when it's on. No, there's, of course, the it's hub flex. in the morning. Yeah. I'm a feminist, but I put on this pencil skirt tonight because I've been watching a lot of Mad Men. <laughs> it's my way of getting to sleep. I'm re-watching the series, and you see a lot more in it when you watch it multiple times. And I put this skirt on because I thought, I'll pretend to be Joan from Mad Men. I'll get into a character. But when I put it on, I thought, oh, I think I look more like Peggy when she was too naive to realise she was pregnant. I will not have it. No, I just had that moment of going, you think you're being Joan, but really you're being Peggy. <gasps> you when are she was Joan. rushed to hospital. Yeah, you're Joan. You're jo exactly. Look, Tell her she's your Joan. There's one supportive woman in the audience who truly believes <laughs> yeah. in Joan. Thank you. Thank you. Doesn't okay. help you're holding a pint and really far back. No. Yeah, Joan. Okay. Yeah, Joan. All right. All right. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do the full turn. Joan, 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 Joan. And I will now declare that just before I came out, I was so worried I looked like Peggy and not Joan. Peggy looks fantastic, by the way, at all times. She's even the top when she thought she was pregnant. But, you know, she's got that slightly... When she's in the early series, she comes into her own. She just looks a bit like... You know, that's the whole character. The idea of the character, she's not sure of herself. She's not certain. And I looked at the mirror and went, oh, I think you've got to be less Peggy. Less Peggy, series one, more Joan. And I don't normally do this... But I slipped on, and I really don't. I don't agree with them, and I don't believe in them. I slipped on some Spanx. <laughs> right. Underneath. But then I realised, as I got here and sat down, what I'd put on is your skin-coloured Spanx, but I've had a spray tan. So that's how it looks. <laughs> oh. Terrible. I need spray tan-coloured Spanx. It looks great. That part doesn't look as good. That's more season one, Peggy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be fair, and this is actually a serious point, that they even call that skin colour. A, no one's skin is that colour, but you can't have anything that's nude or skin colour because that colour does not exist. Mm, that's there true. So many and also, I must colours. say, Caucasian skin colour. But even yes, then... I'm that very is, sorry. Yeah, but even then, that is not... That's just... I, it, the implication was my skin colour, but I should say... What's nice Caucasian is some of the tan has gone onto it. You can't see it from here, but some of the tan has gone it onto hasn't. it, so it's kind of stained. The, tan, the... the tan's proper washed off. This is... That's not happened. I am a feminist, but only when it suits me. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> That's not true. Monday to Friday at best. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but 90% of my career is now answering the question on Instagram, where did you get those reading glasses? <laughs> and I'm good with it. I'm fine. I feel like I've reached a happy zone. Je suis un féministe, mais je pense qu'on parle en français. C'est plus sexy qu'on parle du féminisme en anglais, non? Parce que le français, c'est sexy, sexy, c'est chiqui, chiqui. Mais euh, le féminisme en anglais, c'est pas... Alors, alors, arrête, je sais, je sais. Oh, oh, oh. <rire> Je vais traduire. Um, I am a feminist, but I think it's more sexy when you talk about it in a French accent, so you know. Uh, not in English, because in French it's like a oh, sexy, sexy, cheeky, cheeky. Uh, but in English it's like, come on, I know, get over it, you've had your day. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing the show three and a half years. We've never had anything like that in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> I basically know the makeup of an I'm a feminist butt now. I know what the patterns are. I know how to write them. I've never heard anything like that. <laughs> well, you know, you're getting a broader audience now, Deborah. Yeah. So I think it's time we thought of them. It's good. It's good. I'm a feminist, but recently we did the Guilty Feminist for the first time at the Royal Albert Hall. Woo! <laughs> what a show. 
And I was slightly disappointed that nobody arranged for John Hamm to come out onto the stage and surprise me oh. when I specifically told my husband it's what I wanted for my birthday, which is in December. <laughs> I've dropped so many hints. I'm like, wouldn't it be funny, right, if John Hamm <laughs> walked out when I was talking about him and everyone was like, oh, my God, he's there. And someone had bothered to do that at the Royal Albert Hall. They didn't do it at the Palladium. They didn't do it at the Palladium the second time. They didn't do it at the Royal Albert Hall. And they haven't done it here tonight. But then, if I had, and I was going to Deborah as your friend, it would have been all about ham and not about ma'am. Do you know oh. what I mean? I thought you were going to say not about cheese. <laughs> um, I... I do know what you mean. I do know what you mean, but I'd be okay with it because it would be just that moment of the mm. show. And then we'd have a little interaction. I'd interview, I'd interview him about how feminist Madman is. We'd have a little sofa section. So I haven't thought about it much, mm. about how it would go. It would be quite fun for him to come out and be like, I'm a feminist, but... Oh! Wouldn't in a lot good? of the roles I portrayed, I treat women very badly. <laughs> but... <laughs> but if you and I were to spend the evening alone together, I would treat you very, very well. Mm. He's talking to me. Do oh. <laughs> but you know, if I'd booked him, Deborah, I'd got to be in the room. You know, I'd absolutely have to be in the room. It's true. And I know what... You would go home with John Hamm, wouldn't you? And the two would be, be the bread and he'd be... The I'd have to just ham. be happy about it. Oh, we could do it. A... Oh, are you suggesting a ham sandwich? I am. I ham, I ham, I ham. <laughs> Live from King's Place in London, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest guys, Ashley B, and our very special guest, Danny Albanese, talking about loneliness. <laughs> this is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White, with me is Ashley B, and we're talking about loneliness. Yay! Holler, holler. That's the biggest cheer loneliness has ever yeah, had. I know. That's a really, it's a <laughs> phenomenal cheer for loneliness. Give us a cheer for loneliness. You! Let's hear it if you're secretly lonely quite a lot of the time. Yay! I find it really Some sure. arrogant people in there going, I've got loads of friends, bitch. I've got loads of friends. I'm never alone. I when mean, Jesus is near. <laughs> I've got loads of friends and I'm still lonely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And also, I think I went through a real phase of feeling like if my friends were really my friends, they'd invite me to the cinema. I have never invited you to the cinema. Are you going to bring this up now? Yes. I don't really go to the cinema, Deborah. Well, Are you I know really you do, do this now because I've all seen it on friends? Instagram. I've seen you and everyone I know going to the cinema. <laughs> no, but it's true, though. I feel like I was the only one inviting people to the cinema or saying, shall we all go to this? I didn't organise anything. Nothing would be organised. I know what you mean. Like, you're always the admin on the WhatsApp group. It's like, instead of always the bridesmaid, never the bride, it's like, always the admin of the WhatsApp group, never added to the WhatsApp group. <laughs> I get that it. That is the modern. I feel you. Down. I yeah. feel you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or you make a WhatsApp group and people just immediately leave without saying anything. Oh my God, isn't that the coldest modern thing you can do? Yeah. I know it's annoying, but to leave is so bloody cold. Yeah. Especially if they do without saying goodbye. Just isn't mute it. Just mute it. Just mute it. Just yeah, mute, just it. mute it. <laughs> or at least message you privately going, hey, this is the reason I came off. Yeah. Something like You're that. You're annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was really annoying to be added. Never do that again. I will say adding people to a larger WhatsApp group without their consent is also problematic as well. Oh, I'm added to 80 people for Lauren's potential birthday picnic pencil for Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> and then everyone knows your phone number as well. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And somebody that you don't want to have it who fancies you. Can I tell you, actually, where I was the person who did that? <laughs> Can 
my, this is, I'm not even sure we can leave it in the podcast for the record, but I'll tell you here now. My birthday is the day before St. Patrick's Day. So I am a stereotype and I always have a big old who can party every year. And the admin to individually mail all people. And again, eventually, when you're on telly, you have a couple of people on, off telly, blah, 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 in your contacts that you want to invite. But you wouldn't necessarily give out their numbers. But you'd hope there'd be an element of trust in a WhatsApp group. Anyways, <laughs> I make up this WhatsApp group. And there's a lot of people in it. And that's only from, like, A to S. And um, one of our friends... Actually, has she ever been on the show? Uh, Dana Alexander, I add yes, her yes, as well, yes. invite her to my birthday party, brilliant stand-up. And it turns out I probably one digit wrong for Dana Alexander's phone number. And in this WhatsApp group, it's people like Jonathan Ross. And um, I, clang, name drop, and I'm ever like, hey guys, come and get absolutely hammered at my birthday party. I'll be there wearing my normal sexy clothes. Sexy, sexy, come and visit my birthday party, blah, 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 and the details. I immediately get a phone call from a man who says, excuse me, why are you ringing my 13-year-old son asking him to a birthday party? Oh, no. And the number I'd gotten wrong was a 13-year-old boy's phone number. (gasps) And now that family, somewhere in England, I'm assuming it was Birmingham, have access to all of these people's phone numbers. I'm like, oh, shit! And I'm the (laughs) paedophile. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. So this 13-year-old boy, I just really wanted him to turn up all the same. You know, Hello, I've been invited to the sexy, <laughs> sexy party. Made my friend and cycled all the way from Birmingham. <laughs> like, can you imagine? And then I was like hoping he wouldn't look through the numbers because be, some people have their names. Yeah. All, and some that, of the people on there. It comes up in faint writing, doesn't it? If it, it kind of guesses who they are. Yeah. And I would be furious if someone did that to me and released my number to the 17 people who'd care. But um, yeah, I basically asked yeah. a 13 year old boy to my birthday party. That was, oh, the thought. The, the anger and panic in that man's voice, rightly so as a parent of an older woman who'd sent him a sexy, sexy party invite. <laughs> oh. And it was a picture of me with a pint and a fag in my hand going, happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <laughs> and at first I was, I was really annoyed because I said, do not reply all to this WhatsApp group. And then I saw Dana Alexander go, who is this? And I was like, Dana has my number, but it turns out that was a father of the kid. Oi, 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 mamma mia. But do you think the kid said, Dad, I, can I go to this? <laughs> Jonathan Ross is going. <laughs> so, loneliness. Um, yes. Yeah. It's easy. <laughs> it's probably... Now you know what happens to lonely women of a certain age. It's pr- <laughs> It's Hello, would you like to come to my sexy, sexy party? <laughs> There's free sweets for it's anyone who comes, boys. It's probably a sign. It's in the woods and you can bring your sister and the whole house that the party's in is made out of sweets. It's... And you can eat the house if you want, boys. You it's can eat probably, that house. <laughs> it's probably a sign that you're lonely mm. if, if, if you do continue to message that boy yeah okay um, okay okay but look wait till he's he's 13 now oh that was last birthday he's probably yeah. 14 now yeah just you've got four years until you can legally adopt him, him. <laughs> hello guilty feminists It's Jessica Regan here interrupting your podcast to tell you about our Big Speeches workshops, which are happening on the 28th of July and the 4th and 11th of August. Uh, They're all Sundays and they're all happening at Ye Old Rose and Crown Theatre Pub in Walthamstow in London. So to book your places for those, please go to guiltyfeminist.com. I'm also really happy to tell you that we're bringing the Big Speeches workshop to Chester. The Storyhouse Theatre is hosting us on the 31st of August. So if you'd like to book a place for that, please go directly to the theatre's website, www.storyhouse.com. Really looking forward to seeing you there. Hi, it's Tom. It's Jess. And John. From the Best Pick podcast. We're just dropping in to let you know that we're doing another live recording. On Sunday the 15th of September at 12 noon, we'll be watching Alfred Hitchcock's Rebecca. 
please come along and watch it with us and we would love to hear your questions and comments afterwards. It won't be just us on the mic, it'll be you too. And you get to watch the movie with us uh, during the course of the show. Book your tickets now by going to kingsplace.co.uk. We'll see you there. Bye. Now, Ashley, <gasps> you've just made an incredible television show which is soon to be aired. Yes. I went to see two episodes of it which were broadcast at the BFI mm-hmm. and I was so impressed with it because it's talking about mental health. It's a half-hour scripted comedy but it's got deep heart and I just don't think we talk about enough in terms of mental health. Loneliness, I just don't think we discuss it because we're all embarrassed that we're lonely. Mm. But we are. And there's a scene in it that really got me where your character, whose sister's with Sharon Horgan's character, she's joking around, her sister's going out and we know that your plans have been cancelled. But she fakes it and tells the sister that it's just happening later. She doesn't want to admit that she's been dumped, basically let down by somebody else. And it's by friends, not by man. I mean, a man can be a friend, but it's not. Not it's John Ham. <laughs> and so she lies, which, you know, we've all done. We've all pretended, oh, no, I've got a great thing going on. Oh, no, no, I'm going to be going out tonight. Oh, yeah, yeah it's all going to be fine, because we don't want to admit I've got nowhere to be. And then she's joshing around making the sister laugh and keeping her late, because sort of when you are lonely and when you are feeling low with mental health issues, that's normally portrayed on the screen as... I'm a sad person who's very, very sad. But that's not what we do. We hide it. And we try and be entertaining to get people to stay. And she's joking around, doing a funny little dance, and a funny little routine. The sister's laughing. And when the sister walks out the door, your character just crumbles onto the floor and just starts sobbing. And it is a comedy, by the way. It's really funny. <laughs> it's really funny. But this part is not funny. This part was so... And it just made me cry. I've seen that episode twice now. And it just made me cry both times but like proper tears not you know normally you sort of well up a bit don't you when you see something on screen just like proper streaming streaming tears because I'm like I really relate to that which is I've tried to be entertaining they haven't stayed I'm thinking about Edinburgh festival shows I've done and (laughs) they've all left and then I've just cried Uh, but there's that moment where and it was just something so truthful I've never seen on screen before so one of the things the show was marketed it's a comedy about you know a kind of English language teacher and her sister but really it's about loneliness but that's how bad for branding (laughs) but one of the reasons is even in terms of marketing something as about loneliness is it's disgusting to some people because it's sort of like our secret shame Mm. and you're afraid if, oh, if I say I'm lonely, people won't want to hang around with me and that's the cure. Because if I say I'm lonely, then maybe people might feel like they could catch it from me or there must be something wrong with me that I'm lonely. So I don't want to be around you because there's something wrong with you in some way. Whereas to be lonely is so part of the human condition. It's oh. so normal. And well, you can be lonely in a relationship. You, you can, can be, be lonely, lonely in a relationship. Different. You You're can lonely be lonely in, in motherhood or fatherhood. You can be lonely in a friendship. You can be lonely in so many ways. And once it's in there, it sort of burrows away and digs in deep. And I was reading, and I mean, it's a very obvious thing to say about social media, but I've read up a lot about loneliness and the l- neurological effect on people and the biological effect on people. And if you have a support network when you're getting out of hospital, you are more likely to do well and recover quickly than if you're on your own. There's a lot in the idea that, say, for example, um, you know, when there's that idea of, oh, she died three weeks after her beloved husband, because loneliness and heartbreak has a physiological effect on you. And the thing that can cure it is human touch, human connection, when you're talking to someone, looking into someone's eyes. So, for example, all of us, there are people listening to this, and I hope you're all well, but the connection of all of us in a room right now of physical human beings being in a collective space is so much more powerful than just listening in. And the effect that it has on the body, and now we substitute, like I can, we often, we normally WhatsApp, we never call each other, and we're doing that there, but we're not actually physically doing this, Mm -hmm. which is a more important form of connection than texting, and we're substituting connection with each other in so many ways, and we don't realise it, logically, because we're doing it through our phones, but our bodies are realising it. That's kind of what I want to explore with every character. And it is a comedy again, Lance. Um, Sorry, say that again. When is your show 
The show is out in August. I can't say the exact date yet because Channel 4 won't let me. But I know. Secret, secret. <laughs> For the people listening at home, I just did a terrible glasses joke again. I don't know why I'm hammering it up. And it's out in America. For all our American listeners, I can say it's out in, on Hulu in America. All of it on August 21st in America. So it'll all be out at once. But with every character, I was trying to find out what is their loneliness. So mm -hmm. whether it's two men who can't talk to each other or someone who is English as a second language and you don't get to be your whole full personality and that can be really lonely to try and express yourself or make friends in a new country. I'm very privileged as an English-speaking immigrant to arrive here and be able to immediately roughly be myself even under the guise of being Irish. But if someone else comes here, <laughs> Irish, I know it's been working for me so far, but I'm secretly from Scunthorpe. <laughs> um, but it's cute, right? Um, but like to not have English as your first language, to get to know people, to connect. And mm. all of that was sort of filtering in. It's a thing I've come across that's not gendered. It's not an age thing. It's not based on whether you're single or in a relationship. Loneliness is like a common cold, but there is a way out of it. And we are our own answer to it. I've heard a lot of people, I had a lot of people email me and say that when they were feeling very lonely, that the podcast was very important yeah. to them because it feels like a tribe. And so it is. Even if you can't get here, because not everyone can get here because of accessibility, where they live, mm -hmm. money, disability, all sorts of reasons you might not be able to actually be in the building. Mm -hmm. And we hope that it does feel like a tribe. We really in hope fact, it does. for anyone but who's listening to the podcast now, why doesn't everyone say a big hello to them now? Hello! That's for you there. Yeah, but it is important as well. And I just think if there's an elderly lady living in your block of flats and you decide she's your gran... She is. Mm. You know, if you just, just... And it's hard, and it's hard to know nowadays what is, okay. as we all know from my WhatsApp texting, what's creepy and what's not, guys, and it's a real okay. game of Russian roulette. Uh, how well, to kind of people... approach people and start making friends or, or kind of have a contact. And sometimes it is just a smile oh. or an acknowledgement of another human being when they smile at you and that sort of just tiny little things throughout the day. Because you never know when that's going to make a big and difference some to someone. some people may have taken that to you literally about deciding someone's your gran. <laughs> deciding someone's... Like, do tell them you've decided that. And... Rather go, hello, granny! <laughs> Happy Christmas, where's my present? I don't know you. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, take that metaphorically and just sort of, you know, if you pop in on someone or bring them something from the shops or something like that spontaneously and you, say, you have a chat to them, the way we can create community just by being brave enough to talk to somebody mm. it's so instant we can but do even, it so isn't it even interesting that that's the way we can conceive loneliness an elderly person on their own rather than maybe if you have a large group of friends or how else it might look in certain ways we've kind of boxed it off it's like that's what it looks like and mm. I think what I want to do the show is it can look like so many varieties of things and to see everyone with their complexities and all of the little different bits and bobs we have to each other that to write someone off as the front of them yes. uh, it doesn't always look like you think it's going to look completely. You know? I'm very excited about you watching it. I'm going to say what I always say, uh, which is if we don't support it, then what they say, if it's a boy show, they go, that show didn't get the ratings. If it's a girl show, they say, see, girl shows don't work. There's no mm. more girl shows for 10 years. So as feminists, we need to get behind it because it's a really beautiful show. It's about a uniquely female experience and... It also has a diverse cast, lots of lovely viewpoints. I will it. say it's not about a uniquely female experience, though. I will say a lot of the themes in it uh, hopefully transcend a lot of different types of people's experience. That's true. But, but on it's the a female, female note, POV. female commissioner, Channel 4, uh, made by Sharon Horgan's company, which is an all female company, written and co exec by myself who identifies as a woman, uh, lots of women in the show. So the chain of command is really quite strongly female from top to bottom, which is a big change in that terms of like getting women into power and bringing us up with it. And then a beautiful male director, wonderful male producer and a variety of people involved. Yeah, but I think the... everyone will relate to it. But in terms of feminist watching it... Oh, yes, please. We've got to support female-created content. Or Definitely. they do make... They really do. They say, oh, well, that didn't work back to boys shows so mm. it's important that we do but also you won't have any problems supporting it because it really is very very funny and also horrifyingly relatable at times Aye. hello guilty feminists briefly interrupting your podcast listening 
just to say thank you so much to everyone who came out to the Royal Albert Hall, told someone, wanted to come but couldn't, participated on stage or backstage. It was the gig of our lives. We'd love to share a highlights in podcast form. We don't normally sell advertising due to many and various feminist reasons. But for this one, we would need a sponsor because it costs extra if you want to release a podcast from a venue like the Royal Albert Hall. So if anyone was interested in sponsoring a Royal Albert Hall Guilty Feminist episode and has two and a half thousand pounds, then please let us know and we'll do our best to get it out to you. Are you going to Edinburgh? We will be there on the 2nd, on the 3rd and on the 4th of August at 4pm in the Pleasance Grand. Go to pleasance.co.uk for Guilty Feminist tickets Right now, they're selling very fast. On the 10th of August, we'll be on the South Bank in London at 7.15pm at the Underbelly. Go to underbellyfestival.com for tickets, also going fast. And on the 24th of August at 7.30pm, we will be at the Edinburgh Playhouse with the Secret Policeman, the legendary Amnesty International show. Uh, We've got all sorts of incredible people on the bill, including Nish Kumar, Rachel Paris, Phoebe Robinson from Two Dope Queens, Desiree Birch, Cindy V, all sorts of incredible people. Grace Petrie, Jess Robinson, you have got to get tickets right now. Go to atgtickets.com for details. Now, back to the podcast. Our guest today was described by the New York Times magazine as opera's coolest soprano. I saw her Cinderella at Glindbourne yesterday and I was alone right away. So before she comes out to sit and chat and join us, please welcome to the stage the incredible Danielle Denise! Woo! And supporting her on the keyboard, Harry Baker! John Hamm! Look, a man! I'm not going to tell you what this is because you'll recognize it eventually. Okay. <laughs> Bâti de l'aile et sa mort, 
Il n'a jamais, jamais connu de loi. Si tu ne m'aimes pas, je t'aime. Si je te me plonge de toi. Si tu ne m'aimes pas, si tu ne m'aimes pas. Incredible. Danny Eldenise is one of the most famous opera singers in the world, and so we're very, very lucky to have her here. And this is actually a concert hall, and it's what's normally used for, so the acoustics are ideal. That was absolutely beautiful, and it's so lovely to have that kind of variety in the show as well, just mm. to sort of suddenly have something... Just something I was like thinking that. of all of your podcast listeners listening and kind of listening to the chat and then suddenly walking along, getting off the tube or something, and all of their like walk <laughs> being suddenly more dramatic because they have this <laughs> backtrack. <laughs> I'm like maybe punching some guy, walking out of the tube like in Killing Eve. Exactly. Shooting someone in the head, going, that's right! Twirling Amazing. an imaginary cape. Yeah. Fighting a bull on the northern line. <laughs> and if you have done that, please email in and let us know which of those activities. Hopefully you've not been the violent injured, ones. listening to a podcast. <laughs> So, Danny, I saw you last night do Cinderella, um, perform Cinderella, not do Cinderella. I, <laughs> I didn't do Cinderella. No. I, I saw celebrity you. gossip. <laughs> I saw you last night, yeah, I saw you last night in Soho House snogging Cinderella and it's <laughs> been all over the evening standard today. No, that's not what happened. Uh, I saw you perform as the title role in Cendrillon. Am yes. I saying that correctly? Cendrillon. Yeah. Cendrillon. Cinderella. Oh la yes. la, je suis un féministe, mais... Euh... <laughs> <laughs> chiki chiki, sexy, sexy. Um, <laughs> it's true, it does make things more sexy. And it was an incredible production, and I, I really thought that these two themes would work incredibly well. The themes of Ashling's show, which is really about being lonely and staying cheerful, trying to kind of battle your way through uh, loneliness. It's so Cinderella, because... The one thing about her, the really lovable thing about Cinderella is that despite the fact that she's in this terrible situation where she's being put into this very subservient role by her own family, she remains cheerful and she tries hard to please everybody. Now, the Cinderella I saw last night, I've never seen the Cinderella done like this before. Yeah, we should tell you why that is. Normally, if you see Cinderella, like in the ballet or in the opera, you would see a really beautiful fantasy fairy tale version. And this production was directed when it was originated on tour by Fiona Shaw. Whoa! Uh, yeah. Wow. And yeah, Fiona's, you know, obviously an amazing actress. And um, she had this idea because the role of the prince is played by a woman. She thought, well, They're traditionally played by a mezzo. Yeah, so it's, yeah. Play, it's a trouser role. It's what we call a trouser role where a man's <laughs> role is sung by a woman. And uh, trouser role is something I think feminists should use more often. <laughs> um, I feel like that's something Theresa May would say. Well, there are trouser roles and there are skirt roles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Somebody told me last night, who knows a lot more about opera than I do, it's because the female voices tended to be able to do more things and be more... Mm. Be, yeah, there's also subtle. a little bit of um, gruesome history to it because there was a vocal type called the castrato, which was a male singer who had his um, cojones snipped. Oh, my God. Right to off. reach high notes. To reach high notes. So he didn't actually get to puberty. I mean, well, he got there, but he didn't... Um, you know, his voice didn't drop because of this phenomenon. Um, and what parents would spot talent in someone young or they would spot talent and just do yeah, that. Yeah, so like, like voice soprano. Is. And they would just keep going like that. <gasps> they didn't want it to change. And at a certain point in history, that was outlawed. And so then women had to sing those roles because they were written in the range of where a boy would sing wow. like voice soprano. So um, Fiona had this idea of what if the prince 
is a woman. And the other thing we should say about the show is, is that it is not a fairy tale uh, setting. It's set in today, 2019. So we ask the question, how do you fit this Cinderella template, this fantasy, beautiful story in the age of today? And if Cinderella was a person today, then where would she be? And what would her life be like? So, I mean, it's one of the things I do love about the work that I do, and, and opera does it a lot, is we do challenge these tropes. And um, it was really so inspiring and enjoying to look and kind of understand, okay, if Cinderella in the fairy tale goes, oh, the prince like rejected me, I'm gonna go and die by the oak, then we go, what does that mean today? So she kills herself. I mean, that's what that means. And so we took those ideas and put them in and go, well, if that's today, what is killing yourself? Oh, what's means, the modern you know? day workplace? Because excuse mm -hmm. me, I haven't seen it. So what's the modern day workplace she's in, or is she in some? So kind of she modern is day in slavery? a house where the stepmom is like Chris Jenner, um, <laughs> and like has a kind of punkish haircut, and the girls are like the two Kardashian sisters, mm. and um, they're constantly Instagramming. They're constantly themselves. like <laughs> and taking yeah. their photos and like completely vapid, you know. And Cinderella, you know, obviously she lost her mother, so she's in this circumstance where she doesn't have any control over her situation. So she basically is in a state where she has no choice. She has no autonomous choice in her life, but she tries to make the best of it. But my character, I feel anyway, um, has made a decision that actually life is just, is, the whole thing would be better if she wasn't there. The whole hate that the stepmother has for her, the fact that the family's fighting about her state, but she knows exactly where she's going. And it reminded me of a lot of stories I've read in the current events when people have committed suicide where their loved ones say, but they seem so fine. I mean, I, I just saw them and they were calm, happy, and left no signs of the, what they had as the impending event they already knew was going to happen. Mm. So it, yeah, it just, it's a very intense production. And it also, it what asks, happens with the storyline mm. of the prince in that situation? Or is yeah, that so it asks like? this question of like, you know, we're in the LGBTQ mm -hmm. generation. So, you know. Just to be clear, she's okay. She doesn't die. She's also, can I just say, there's no such thing as committing suicide. That has a gruesome history as well. Oh, God. Mm. Committing what have is I a, said? Well, no, you can only commit a crime. Right. So it's take your own life take or whatever it is. Just, it's an opportunity yeah. to learn. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because there was a time when you could be, even in Ireland, uh, my dad took his own life when I was a kid. Mm. And when yeah. he died, it was still illegal. So it could be, a, it was a criminal, it was only like decriminalized in 1991. Big shout out to the church. Um, but uh, it, that also has a yeah. gruesome history mm. because- But we just say it because yeah. that's what's what yeah, we Yeah, because it's the kids, words are in, but if you think about yeah, it, committing but language something. Language is, phrase. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we say it, say it so often. Is powerful. But it, again, a gruesome Absolutely, history about yeah. a thing where their partner might not be entitled to their will or their share of, uh, yeah. thing because technically the person would have committed a crime, almost oh, like as if they yeah. did insurance fraud or something like that. It's like the, the, the same <sighs> kind of thought yeah. process. Yeah, yeah, And just yeah. through the syntax of that language. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. And it's really powerful language mm. about what permeates or what goes in subconsciously. Um, she doesn't die, just to be clear. So if you're going to see it and don't... Spoiler like, oh, alert. Yeah. Well, I just think it's sort of yeah. like, I don't want you to think it's Cinderella with a tragic ending. But I no, do, but it gets not dark. even a telling of the story that I But the original knew. is, the, the whole story is quite dark. This sounds a bit sexy, and it will be. Um, <laughs> but do you know the original, um, you know the glass slipper is a glass or a fur slipper? And there's a lot of original tellings of it where the fur slipper was, guys, fur slipper, le vagine, it was the vagina and the idea oh. that the man would go round, the prince went round and basically uh, like had sex with as many women to find <gasps> this girl he was he thought was really good at having sex. Yeah, like so that's crazy. one of the retellings of it, yes. And then fur and stuff like that got exchanged between fur and glass what? and it became this idea. But there is an, a, like so a it version of it that was a fur in her slipper. slipper. <laughs> yeah. oh, it doesn't fit. God. So it was a gal. It used to be a great thing when you had a big gape and wide fanny. Because uh, oh, a big old fucking <laughs> and that is how you get yourself a prince, gals, back in the day. <laughs> this is nowhere near where I thought this was going to go, yeah. just to be very, yeah. very clear. Old Ask Jeeves over here, always Can ready you? to step in and help. But that is, the, like, there is a version of it, but because the story is, there's so many versions of this subservient woman with the, the person trying to mm. find them across so many cultures. Yeah. Like, there's a Cinderella tale, mm. like, there is in so many things. And it's dark. It's a dark... Yeah. 
story. The thing that really I found compelling about this production is that in the first act, the prince is played by a woman, but it's an androgynous sort of character, a bit like an androgynous rock star. It actually reads, the prince reads a bit like Prince, the rock star. Yeah. There's a girl in the household who she works with that, I mean, she clearly has an affinity with, a connection with, but she's unable to verbalize or understand in herself what that is. And the stepsisters go off to the ball and she lays down by the fireplace to go to sleep. Life sucks, but never mind. And she basically dreams up the prince. So in this version, she never gets to go to the ball. She dreams that she gets to go to the ball. Mm -mm. And in her dream, the prince is played by this girl she has the he has the face of her like best friend mm. so that threads the character of the prince from the female incarnation of her through to her dream prince which is actually this girl the way i read it when i saw it was that the reason the prince was so miserable in act 1 is the prince was all along a trans woman and so when the prince in act 2 is a woman and she's happy, it felt like a trans story. Also, because the prince is normally just a cipher. He's just normally, like, there to fall in love with. Mm. But in this version, the prince very much has her own story, and yeah. it goes from a sadness to a happiness. I read it as a trans story, but then I was very interested that also it was a story about a young woman realising that she was a lesbian and she was in love with this woman but she yeah. couldn't conceive of it because she hadn't seen enough of that in her environment yeah um, and when we were staging it I remember saying at one point you know okay so this is where we're going with this is this what's going to happen she's going to realize that she um, is in love in fact the feeling that she has for the friend is actually more something more profound and is she going to get her prince and mm -hmm. at one point there was a question of sort of, well, maybe not. Maybe she just realizes that they have a really good bond and there's a friendship. But we, we enjoyed staging it bit by bit and going with where the staging was taking us based on the music so and based on the players. Yeah. yeah, and we basically found that it was completely organic that Cinderella would try to summon her prince back because she thinks that that's what she wants and then learns through the interaction with the, um, her dead mother and her father that that's a reality that isn't real. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt your content consumption, but can I quickly suggest a podcast you might like? It's called Grown Up Land. Every week, comedian Heidi Regan, podcaster Ned Cedric, if that is even a job, Syrian Dreamboat, Steve Alley, and me, comedian Sophie Duca, are joined by a brilliant guest to discuss the bewildering pursuit of adulthood. We talk sex, jobs, rejection, jealousy, sex, all with help from BBC Radio 4. That's the Grown Up Land podcast. Make sure you subscribe on BBC Sounds. Honestly, I would really recommend going to see this production. I think I'd never been to Glyndebourne before, and I thought, because it's a house of the country, and I thought, oh, my God, it's Where very is it? grand. So it's, all, it's, it's in, in Lewis. It's, it's in an hour south on the train from London, Victoria. There's a little loop there for Lewis somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so there yeah. are people listening to this podcast who live near Lewis, live in Brighton. Oh, yeah, if you live, live in Brighton, it's 15 yeah. minutes, 20 it's, minutes. Yeah, So and, and I like to recommend things that are outside London as well, but it is a short hour train There ride. are people too. <laughs> yes. People, this is for people who live in not London. Um, not London is a large place. Um, but if you do live in London, rightly, um, then, you Burn. Can, then you can just jump on the train to Victoria. It's really not very far away. But yeah, what Victoria. I thought about Grindborn, and I, I like the opera, I don't know enough about it to have it ruined for me. I just know that I like the sound of it. And I like the, you know, this is a very spectacular production. We've got beautiful kind of revolving doors and all sorts of gorgeous, gorgeous Lots of things, prisms, lots of glass reflecting. Oh, it's very, We'll very, say I'm very afraid stunning. of a revolving door traditionally, but I'll give it a go. <laughs> no. have to look very at they, stuck in many of them. They don't very push you through them, just to be clear. You're only watching them and no one gets stuck. Oh, okay, so I don't have to Spoiler go through them alert, myself. No one gets stuck permanently I in did once. Door. I got stuck in it once. Did you? Yeah. Well, while you were they singing, were... you were like, oh! No, no, I went to the door. No, I... <laughs> 
literally, I literally went inside one. It, it started to sort of push go against on, me. You got, it's, once and you're I in, went, you're in. I went inside it, and then it turned around, and I was going like, I was singing my line, and I realized I'm facing backstage. And oh. I was like, okay, I'm not. I, I looked at the technician, and he was sweating bullets because obviously he was operating it and knew that something had gone wrong. I think he was a stand-in person mm. for that. Oh. I, I just went, I'm not going to say anything. This will turn around at some point, and I just. Classic revolving door. <laughs> it's like life, guys. It will turn around at some point. It will turn around. At some point, you'll find yourself facing the audience again. It's all going to be Metaphor fine. Metaphorical life. Breathe. This will turn yeah. around at some Breathe. point. Breathe. <laughs> um, but I would recommend it. What do you... Because I think with opera, we think the ticket price is prohibitive. I'm not going to be able to afford it. What do your ticket prices start at? Are there any reasonably priced tickets? Um, yeah, you can... There is under 30s nights where you can get in for 30 quid. A really tall Yeah, but what about everyone else, though? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So, there, <laughs> like, right now, there are seats going... I mean, it's, we're midway through a run that's been very successful. So, there are Amazing. tickets... Only a few left. But there are some at 60 pounds and there are some at 30 pounds. And so, call up the Glenborn box office if you're interested. You know, obviously... Just having performed for you guys and talking with you. If you come and see the show, you have to let me know. I'll leave me a note at the stage door or something and um, we'll have a drink at the bar after because we always come out at Glenbourne to the long bar and That's a big um, everybody offer. congregates. So I'm going to leave that offer for the people in this room because if I put that on the podcast, you might find you're having a very big drinks party every single night. <laughs> All right, we'll try it. We'll try yeah, it. Just hit me up. Just call me. Just, <laughs> if you're go, okay, so if you're going for The Guilty Feminist, just put a note at the door saying, well, I'm here because of The Guilty Feminist. Yeah. And I'll see you in the bar after. Look, let's try it. It's, and £30, you might think, oh, that's a lot of money. In which case, go on to iTunes and Spotify and find Danny's singing. It's just absolutely incredible. And listen to it at home. But if there's any way that you can, and it is a really spectacular production. There's a lot of people you have to pay. There's a full orchestra. This is why opera is expensive. There's this a full is what orchestra. I always say. It's the biggest collaborative medium in the sense that there are hundreds of people that have to go into putting on an opera and they need to take home a paycheck. So it's also the o- one of the only experiences where it is completely unamplified. And I mean, you heard me sing now, wow. unamplified. Mm-hmm. And So you guys um, have no microphones around things? Not a single... Whoa amplified no sound comes to you through a box and we have so many i mean everything comes to us through a box some sort of box an apple tv or a tv or um you know boom box or whatever then you go and you can hear you hear the human voice sort of hit you like that so it sounds like these sopranos are not gangsters (laughs) (laughs) so sitting on that joke for a while i thought i'd go better if i was honest And if you're thinking, oh, yeah, but it's inaccessible because I won't understand what they're saying, they have surtitles. Yeah. So above the singer's heads, you will see what they're saying. Ah. And it's clear as well because of the way that they're acting. acting. And the acting, But the reason I mostly want to recommend this show is because I think, firstly, it's directed by a woman. Uh, Opera tends to be a very male-dominated field. Um, Can be, but changing. And it's changing now. And again... We need to support the things that are changing. We don't want opera to be a dead art form. There's so much beauty in it. But Fiona Shaw, who is an amazing queer director, directed this... Danielle's performance is incredible, but also, you know, the fact that the prince is a woman and that storyline is played with the fairy godmother's voice is just the most spectacular thing. It's just oh, yeah. incredible. It's just Once in a about. lifetime opportunity. It's very, very, very beautiful. Mm-hmm. You have to dress up at Glyndebourne, which I think also people might go, oh, but it's just a fun opportunity. You don't you just take something out of your wardrobe that you d- wouldn't normally dare wear. You could wear what Deborah's wearing. Yeah. And you, but what you Absolute just, Joan outfit. You. <laughs> Similarly, just leave a note and say, I need to go to Glyndebourne. I'm going to need to borrow the outfit that you were wearing that night and I will leave it in a box. Uh-huh. Can I have your tan stained spanks? You might have Deborah. millions of calls. Yeah, um, and, and we spend can... time dressing up. I mean, I'm in the theatre two hours early, basically getting all dolled up for the show. and So, so make um, an effort. Danny's yeah, it's getting a bit dressed like, up. It's a, bit, it's a treat and people are really eclectic with how they dress. It's fancy in that kind of be yourself in all your flavours kind yeah. of way. It's and fun. you can have a picnic get some M&S sandwiches and go and have a picnic in the grounds. It's really good fun. Do you know what? I went on the one show. They said to me, oh, it sounds really posh. I'm going to have to get my black tie out and stuff. And I said, listen, it's not posh. Mm -hmm. You can get an M&S picnic. So I used the same example Mm -hmm. that you used. I mentioned that to somebody else and they went, that is posh. And I was like, M&S? I thought they were going for a whole, like, for the everybody type campaign. And she was like, no, it's Aldi. Aldi's not posh. And I was like, I was like, oh, you can't win, but yeah, for, you can make your own picnic. For basically, your picnic can come from anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I want to say, listen... No matter what your, your picnic identifies as. 
<laughs> it is welcome at the opera. To, I feel like there must be times as a woman of colour in opera that it feels lonely and it feels... <sighs> oh, yeah, you know, the very first time that I was asked this was six or seven years ago. I did a big interview with the FT and we spent all this time together and then the journalist at the very last question, we had actually already said goodbye. And then he said, oh, and just like one final question, like have you ever been sort of prevented doing opera with, through barriers of colour? And it was the first time I'd thought about it in my entire life. And that, I have to say, is a bit of a an interesting and enlightening thing when it comes to people's perceptions of opera. Opera is one of the most yeah. colorblind things. If you can sing, you can make it as an opera singer. Yeah. And it's one of the things like in film, whoever would play my father would have to look like me or I would have to look like the father if the father was cast before me. Whereas in opera, they don't care what color your father is. As long as you can be the father or be the princess or be Cinderella, it doesn't matter. And I, I do love that about opera. And you wouldn't think that if you thought about opera yeah, you think in the cliched way. elite, and what is elite in the West is often Caucasian. Yeah. So you're American, aren't you? I'm American. Ah, yeah. you're American. <laughs> but is opera a lot more kind of accessible in it? Because I would think of opera, but it's the same thing. I'm from a horse racing background. Yeah. And horse racing is a very general, most people go in Ireland. But here it's thought of as sort of the queen sport or ascot, or it's a very mm. kind of upper class thing. In America, is it a lot more kind of maybe accessible? I think it's people? the same. I think, I mean, here, when I go to sing at Royal Opera House, I mean, it's a London audience and it's full of everybody. All mm. colours, types, people, height, this, that, you, and the other. You're the second opera singer we've had on the show and you've both been... Who is the first opera singer who went on this show? <laughs> Natalie Kitchen. <Kendrick. laughs> Winfrey. <laughs> opera Winfrey. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this is, this is proving out. Can you please, if you can possibly get there and support this queer retelling of Cinderella that has this heart of loneliness that turns around and has a has a sort of you really won't regret it. And uh, no matter where you are or what you're doing, please tune into this way up. <laughs> internationally on Hulu on the what date? On, on August 21st August and then out 21st. early August on Channel 4 and it's all going to come out at once uh, as soon as episode one airs it'll all be online on all four, on four and then it'll come four. out every week as well on, on telly. So get on all fours <gasps> and and join in. We will follow our Twitter and follow Ashling B or We Must Be on Twitter, mm -hmm. and it'll be you'll be alerted. But these are stories about women. They're about loneliness, but they're about hope and they're about triumph and they're about feeling different, but understanding we all have tribe and we all have connection. And in the end, your stepmother will pretend to love you <laughs> because you've married a prince. If you're pushing hard against the revolving door of life and you feel like you're never going to get out, know that sometimes, guys, a footman's going to come along and go, this way out, lads. Get out of that yes, door. And you're like, oh, my God. Up. This way up. <laughs> this and way I, up. Revolving uh, door. Danielle, do you have a... Do you oh, follow Danielle yeah, on Instagram? Yeah, follow me on Instagram, you guys. I'm Danielle Denise Official. Okay, follow Danielle on Instagram. She's doing some beautiful productions. It's just for the aesthetics. Yeah. So, Danielle, do you have a second song you're going to close out with? I can, if you guys want to hear one. Yeah! Okay. <laughs> then please welcome back to the stage, Harry Baker. <gasps> it's John Hamm! <laughs> Fourth time's a charm. Okay. Okay. I right. just say, I, I picked one that I thought on the subject of loneliness, so it, this is not going to have the same pizzazz as Carmen. Do you want no. me to do Prepare something? Prepare yourself. <laughs> Under it, just to lift it up a bit, maybe. I'll, yeah, I will. I'll just do it. Yeah, I'll, do you know what? I'll work my way into it and I'll just. Yeah. I mean, see how it goes. Yes, yeah. And if you don't feel inspired. No, I'll just do it anyway, Deb. Don't hold back. No, it's good to just read the room. Gotta be confident. Yep. Confident woman. Please welcome back to the mic that isn't being amplified, Danny Aldenace! <laughs> Yeah.
Where is that from, Daniela? People want to hear that again. That is a song called Ja Nel Seno, and it's from my album Diva. <laughs> Diva, the good connotation of the word. Yes, yeah. So you can download, <laughs> download Diva if you would like to. Thank you so much for joining us. Can I just think it might be quite funny. Will you just play that quickly? Basically, like sisters. Duet, duet. You have been listening to the Guilty Fabulous with me, Never Promises Mike, guest co host Ash Lickby, and our very special guest, Danielle Denise. The recording engineer was Corrupt as Music was by Mark Hodge. Live music was by Harry Baker. Producer was Tom Salinsky for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Zoe, Sally, and everyone at these places, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfabulous.com. That's our show. Good night. Wouldn't it be funny, right? Wouldn't it be funny if I was doing an I'm a feminist butt about John Hammond and he's coming out behind me? Oh. <laughs> and if he just, thank you. And if he just came out behind me and the whole audience were like roaring, and I didn't know why, and it was like a panto. And then I turned around and there he was. Wouldn't that be great? And it'd be really funny for the audience. <laughs> Oh, it's, a, it's just a disappointing man not being John Hamm wanting to change my mic. Do you know what? It's not a disappointing man. It's a very handsome, amazing, delightful man who's much more practical than John Hamm who wouldn't know how to change a mic. He wouldn't? No.